everybody thank you for joining me here in my basement uh for a very special cobuzz live uh we have an esteemed music journalist and music fan michael azarad joining us today uh michael thank you for doing this welcome thank you it's my pleasure uh and our musical guest if you will the man of the hour is perry farrell who has got a new box set career retrospective on the way uh and just a a, a great great uh a figure of music who we love at cobuzz it's just the the right kind of music for for our crowd so let's bring him in and i'm gonna step out and michael let you go ahead and 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 talk to the man himself great hi perry hi michael um so i uh i've been listening to all the music on this set and it's it's quite a journey um it's called the glitz the glamour and uh it includes a uh, a memoir by you which is fantastic by the way i loved it Thanks. i wanted more so good it's really well done thank you but there's this uh photo in it of you as a kid with all the neighborhood kids and you're you're all in outfits and stuff like that and i thought like well maybe is that the roots of it you know the glitz the glamour is that is that where your your glitz and glamour started? Yeah.
who spoke to, the, to each other in Yiddish. They were considered Soviet Jews, uh, but they were really, uh, you know, part of part Romanian, part Polish, because at that time, uh, you know, territories were being conquered by other territories. So this small territory of Galicia was taken over by uh, Rom uh, Romania, then Poland, then Russia took over Poland. So it sounds, it sounds kind of like all over the map, but just know that this little area wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a, a place that, uh, it was basically, they called them shtetls in the old days, it was basically ghettos. So we, my family, we didn't come from money, we actually came from a poor neighborhood and uh, what, but what we did for, you know, to pass the time, people had small businesses and they did, you know, handcraft work, but it was the cradle of uh, live theater, small theater, burlesque, um, cabaret, all came out of that area. And it filtered into, yes, it filtered through Russia and Germany and eventually uh, entertainers came to America, they landed in New York, um, the Ziegfeld Follies, you know, it was the early beginnings of, of live theater, small theater, where you might have a comedian followed by dancers, followed by musicians. And that was, uh, that was my family's history. So I loved, calling the, uh, the, the new box set, the Glitz, the Glamour, because it's, it sounds fun and it sounds glamorous, but it took a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears to get my family you know, to America in the 1930s, uh, where we uh, lived in uh, places like Coney Island, Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, and, um, you know, I, we carried on the tradition, or I, I carried on the tradition of uh, being an entertainer. You definitely did, but there's this, if, if, I mean, one through line that I see in all these albums on this, in this box set, is this kind of technicolor feeling. It's very, like, very deep color, very vivid, and all the music is like that. There's no, I, I didn't detect any monochrome. It's just very colorful. And that's one through line, but I want to, um, we can get into that in a little bit, but I, you know, you, you are a, a classic visionary. You imagine things and you make them happen, which is very, uh, forward looking, but this set, this box set is retrospective. It looks back. Um, it goes from, you know, 2007 to 2001 and then back to the mid eighties. And there's also a memoir, which is, you know, like the ultimate retrospective thing to do. What, um, that's very, that's a, a shift of gears for you. And I'm wondering what changed? Why did you envision this project? Well, you know, um, I just recently turned uh, 60, in, you know, into my 60s. I'm now uh, looking at turning 62, my next birthday. I always, I had the desire to uh, write memoirs, if you will, tell the story of my humble beginnings, but I wanted to wait. I wanted to wait to, uh, I want to say the ripe old age. Once I hit my 60s, I thought it would be the proper time to do it because, I, you know, you want to have a great collection of stories. And, you know, I have great stories to, to share in the, in the in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, yeah, sure. But man, by the time you're 60, you've, you've gone up, you've gone down, you've gone sideways, <laughs> and uh, you know, sometimes you've rebounded, sometimes you've not, you've lost, you've loved. So I thought this would be the time to do it uh, and still 
have enough years in front of uh, ahead of me that I can enjoy. You know, now that I've I've uh, you know told everybody where I really came from, I, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to to seeing my friends after they've read the memoirs. Uh, most people don't know a lot of the stories I've. I'm telling in the memoirs, most people don't know, you know, my, my true history. Hmm. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty different. I mean, um, I was not a, a person that wanted to be in music and, you know, uh, from the age of whatever, 10, I started singing and, and uh, being pushed by my stage, you know, my stage parents, no. The story is very, very different. I, at the age of, I would say, three and a half, when I lost my mother, uh, became this kind of wild kid that um, my heroes were my big brother, who was a, a, an outlaw biker, who wrote, drove around New York City like Marlon Brando. He was essentially a greaser, you know? <laughs> but... but um, I really looked up to him because of how tough he was and how wild he was. And he introduced me to rock and roll. And then I had a sister living in uh, Jamaica, Queens. We were on, you know, it was a very, it was one of the great melting pots of the United States. Queens has got every, you know, every type of, uh, you know, uh, person you know, from the Irish to the Italians to the Jews to the, the Blacks to the Chinese to the Puerto Ricans, you know, there was so many different cultures. And my sister happened to love uh, the black the black culture and uh, and soul music and funk. So I started, you know, hearing music at age, like I say, three, three and a half, but I was getting my set, I was getting my record collection from uh, a, ki uh, a brother who was 10 years older than me. So he was already into the Beatles and the Stones and Jimi Hendrix and The Who. And so I was digging that, that kind of sound as a little kid. And then on the other side, I had my sister who was digging, you know, Sly and the Family Stone and James Brown and uh, getting the funk on, you know, and, and George Clinton. So I just fell in love with music. Uh, you know, there, there was no uh, color lines for me. It was all about great music, music that moved me. And, um, but, but we didn't have a, really a, a parental guidance at all. So it was my sister, myself, and my big brother. I mean, we were all just wild maniacs living on the streets, you know. I uh, left home when I was 17. I lasted the longest. Everybody else had left home by the time they were 15, 16. So th at that era, it, it, we're talking about the 60s. I was born in 1959. So I started to get my education in life without parents, but I'm talking like just, you know, some wild kids would, I would be holding their hand and uh, going to the, you know, their friend's house and, you know, looking at what they did at their makeout parties and the music they were listening to. And I became the bartender and I became the entertainer. I would, I would dance for them. Because back in the sixties, if you recall, there, you know, there was always a dance. You know, it started with the twist a long time ago, but then it became the fruit and the hully gully and the monkey and the mashed potato. And th those dances were as important as the music was, really. People would love to listen to music and dance. And now if you fast forward all these years, you see my form of entertainment it's, it's singing and dancing and getting people to loosen up and, and uh, be free. And it, and it crosses, you know, uh, color lines and it crosses music lines too. You know, it was a groovy time, man. 
<laughs> oh, so that so that really ties in, and we're getting way ahead of ourselves. But that really ties into a lot of these remixes that you've done, like your all the dance music threads that run through your solo music. But w w we're getting ahead of ourselves. And I have yeah. one quick question for you before we kind of really dive into the music. But tell us the name, your brother's name. My real brother. Yeah. Okay, so my real brother's name is Favel. So, but that's that's his Yiddish Hebrew name is Favel. But in English, so my mom named us two names that we got a Hebrew, our Hebrew name, mm. and then you get your emphasized name. So my my true name is Peretz, which is the voice of the land. That's my real name. But but but. but yeah. But I was also named Perry. Yeah. Farrell, his real name is Fibel, but his but his anglicized name is Farrell. Uh. So he goes by uh, if you if you look him up online, his he, his handle is Fuck the World Farrell. F T <laughs> yeah F T W Farrell. <laughs> okay, but but is that so? That's where you got your your stage last name, right? So. I'll tell you even more. So, uh, you know, people look at, you look at Wikipedia and say Peretz Bernstein, but that's not even the whole truth. The whole truth is my name is Peretz Berens Tetcher. Be Bernstein is an anglicized name of Berens Tetcher. And in, and in Yiddish, Berens Tetcher means a handsome entertainer. <laughs> but that's my true last name. <laughs> Voice of the land, handsome entertainer. So you're just living out your destiny here. It is, it is what it is. It's yeah. what they call me. Yeah, that's that's pretty great. Yeah. So okay, so so the first record in this box is by Psycom, this band that you're in, starting in eighty one, I think. And, yeah, 1981. And so you you had worked your, your got gone traveled over to uh, Southern California to surf, and, uh, and you start a band. And um, I mean, this is your first band. You never sung in a band before. Right. Uh, eventually, you uh, record these uh, tracks at Radio Tokyo, where a lot of the the cool you know underground Southern California bands recorded. Yeah. Um. To, like, tell me about like, and and there's all these kind of goth influences. I mean, it's seriously goth influenced. Yeah. And I I hear a lot of Susie and the Banshees in that, and I yeah. thought, thinking back on that, I thought like, wow, he, hearing all your music ever since, I I now I hear the Susie, the Susie Sue influence. I thought that was really amazing, and that's one of the great things about a box set like this. You can, it reveals things about an artist, and yeah, yeah. I, I, um, you know, I, I love, love David Bowie, loved David Bowie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, anything I could get my hands on that David Bowie, you know, sang on, produced pictures, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's one of the Holy tr uh, Trinity, right? It's Bowie, Iggy, and Lou, right? Yeah. So, um, I always love this. Uh, I don't know if he did an album. I think it was a single, but in his early days, he did a, a track called The Laughing Gnome. Yeah. Do you know this song? So it's it's so silly. And I must say, was it was it great? It was great to me because I loved David Bowie so much that to get to hear him in his early days before he was so sure of himself that he could come out as a this androgynous uh, space spaceman, no, he was originally writing songs that went like this: ha ha ha, he he he, I'm the laughing no man, you can't catch me, ha ha ha, and that was the chorus. But uh, I understand why it took him a little longer to make it. It wasn't the greatest song at the time, but. Um, this box set that we're putting together has got my group Psycom, which, yes, it does show where, where my 
beginnings were uh, musically. You see, I came to Los Angeles by myself. I was basically a runaway. And so I got in with the punk rock kids. And the punk rock kids allowed you, you know, uh, I, I, I honestly, I did not know how to plug in my microphone. So when I would go for auditions, I would just pray that they already got the microphone plugged in and it's going through the board because one time the guy handed me the microphone, I didn't know what to do with it. Like that's when I started singing. I was really, really green. But it was, a, it was the days of Susie and the Banshees, Joy Division, The Cure, Psychedelic Furs, Killing Joke, you know, um, and then on uh, the electronic side, you know, uh, uh, The Orb and Orbital and Sven Vat, they were, they were doing something also very, very unique in sound, in sound production. So, but um, yes, yeah, Susie. Um, and, and I loved the darkness. Oh, Bauhaus. Yep. I loved, I loved, um, I loved punk, but I loved the drama and, and I loved the, um, the, the, it was like, um, the Velvet Underground had a bit of it. It was femme fatale. Uh, it was darkness, but it was embracing the darkness. And but was, here you are, yeah. But here you are in sunny Southern California. You're a surfer. You surf so much that your hair has turned blonde. Right. But, but what's the attraction to this music that embraces darkness? That seems such a such a contradiction. Well, you know, I I I took my surfboard all the way to California. As I said, I had very little. I had some art supplies, and I had my my uh, I called her the the egg which was my surfboard, it was shaped like an egg. And then I had uh, some clothes. And, um, and honestly, I, I had some weed to, to trade for currency. Um, I, I quickly ran out of money selling off an ounce. Um, but I stopped surfing once I got into Los Angeles. I uh, had that egg and it was just gathering dirt and dust in the back and you know cobwebs in my backyard off of uh, uh, that house that we had on Wilton, six, six in Wilton. That was uh, the original place where Jane's Addiction was formed and all the groups at the time that were coming up. I had a six bedroom house, a big old house that nobody wanted because it was so old, you know, you, you almost couldn't fix it up. You, you want to, you know, take the house down and nobody was in a hurry to do that in this neighborhood. It was not the greatest, but it was old Hollywood near Paramount. It was near Paramount Studios. So uh, I, I hadn't surfed. I stopped surfing. I got it. I got in with the punk rock kids and uh, started getting into drugs and music, and um, and and man, it was it was some of the best times in my life. We were free. We didn't have money, but we had each other, and we had a scene. And it was the most the most important thing was to be accepted into the scene. What other bands uh, that we might know, if any, were in that scene? Well, at that time. The coolest group was the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I've heard of them. I, I uh, you know, we we would go in every every weekend, certainly. But even during the week, we would go out, and because we were musicians, the, the club owners would let the musicians that they knew to they would let us in, so we could like support each other. So there was this kind of cool support system. Um, but the Chili Peppers were, at that time, the biggest group coming up, and they got themselves a record deal. Um, we hadn't had, you know, we didn't even have a record deal yet. They had a, a record out before we ever got signed. But um, the group that was the greatest group, 
Um, you know, there were a couple, you've heard, you know, you, you know of Fishbone. Fishbone in the scene at that time, they were, I, I would say they were the best musicians with the best show. Yep. They were they were out there, man. Yeah. They got the crowd moving and they and um, Angelo Moore, man, he's an incredible performer slash musician. They all are. We we really um, looked up to those guys, you know, and became friends with them. And we became friends with the Chili Peppers too. Guns N' Roses was was coming up at the time too, but they were in a slightly different scene. Their scene was more on the Sunset Boulevard. Uh, they had teased up hair and the spandex, and they had some punk rock to them, you know. Um, they did, but but they went for they shot for the top. They wanted it to be a stadium act, and um, that would be great. I, and I'm not going to say none of us wanted that. <laughs> you know, it would be great if that type of thing were to hit. But this is something for all musicians and musicians, the young musicians especially, to understand that being um, a musician, a lifetime musician, you know, yeah, there's chance, there's a chance you can make a lot of money and make a, a good living. But the best part about being a musician is the life itself and getting getting to be able to perform for people and meeting those people and being part of a scene and, um, you know, being, being so free and liberated that you can dress the way you want, say what you want, and you, you get to be involved in a collective of intelligent, deep, higher, higher conscious people. And um, these days, you know, uh, these days, there's there's never been a better time in history to be a musician. Although you would think, boy, the musician, the, the 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 music world is in sad shape. It it really is in sad shape. But I'm here to tell you that if you do it right, you take your time and you don't be greedy, but you you take your craft serious and you take your passion. And uh, and your gift of tell of storytelling and making people dance, you take that serious. No one can stop you from having the best life as a musician. That those are uh, very inspiring words, um, and thanks for that. Um, but so let's talk about Psycom, the actual music, for a second. Uh, those are thirty-five-year-old recordings. Um, did you? Did anybody kind of work on them to make them sound good? And who did that? And what did you do? Well, you talked uh, a little earlier when you told uh, our audience that uh, I recorded a record with Ethan James. Yeah. The name Ethan James, again, uh, he, he's not a stadium act uh, producer by any means. Uh, Ethan really made his living doing porn soundtracks and punk rock records. And here in California, Southern California, one of the coolest towns you can live in is Venice Beach, California. So Ethan had a little house, that was his house, on a street called Abbott Kinney. Now it's been kind of gentrified. But back in those days, there was, you know, like a gay bar, and there, you know, there might be a, a pizza store, and then there was Ethan James's house, where you hear all these, uh, 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 and you knock on the door and you show up with your little, you know, Marshall amp and your and your Gibson guitar, and uh, you were the band that Ethan was going to do that day. So we saved up our money. And uh, to be 100% honest, when I say we saved our money, my manager at the time, our manager, hold on a second. One second, the doggies are barking at the mailman. <laughs> Is that okay? All good. All right, thank you. So 
there was this girl, Bianca, and she loved the group. And um, I don't want to call her a groupie, although nothing wrong with being a groupie. That was one of the most fun parts of being in the music scene back in those days, you know? The, the, the idea that the girls were hot for the guys and the guys were hot for the girls and guys hot for guys too and girls hot for girls. Everybody was hot for each other, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, and that's just what, how we hooked up and that was our, um, uh, you want I want to say our mating, uh, you know, our, our mating uh, area was, was the clubs, the nightclubs. And so Bianca wanted to manage us and uh, we had no money, but we wanted to make a record. And she was an escort to tell you the truth. So she had more money than we did. And so she put the money up. So that, month, so that record was, was with the help of a couple of sugar daddies. <laughs> Gave us uh, five, we got 500 bucks, put it together and went to Ethan's and it was recorded in one day with Ethan just there at the board. And we just did every, every song. I don't know how many songs, it might have been eight songs, something like that. And they got pressed up. I did the artwork as I was, um, I took my, my talents or my skills that I learned in high school as a graphic, uh, you know, a graphic artist, a graphic designer. And, uh, um, uh, Sometimes for money, that's what I would do. I would I would make drawings for magazines, or uh, you know anybody that needed. I don't know, silly business cards. I was I was good at, at graphic art. So um, why did I tell you all that? Oh, because I did the artwork for the record, and um, but unfortunately the the record was recorded up with thin, rather thin plastic. And uh, we only had 500 copies or something like that. In those days, of course, it, it wasn't a record label. Uh, not only didn't we have time you know, to wait around for a record label, uh, record label didn't really want us. So we went out and did it ourselves. And what you would do is you would go to the record stores in your town with your record, your very own record, you walk in and you'd say, you know, uh, you introduce yourself and say, I've got, you know, this is, a, this is our new record. Could, would you please, you know, uh, stock it? And if it was a major label, they actually would pay you for it. But in our case, the best that I could come up with was, um, could I leave these records with you? So I would leave, you know, five records with this record store then go to the next record store and leave five. And then those records, uh, hardly anybody bought them because they didn't know who we were. And, you know, the best advertisement we could do is handbills, giving out handbills and say, this is our new record, you know? And so the record started to warp. And uh, as, <laughs> as the weeks and the months went on, I would go back to see, did you sell any records? They would go, no, we didn't sell any records. And these are getting all warped, so take them back, you know? <laughs> Fast forward to today, I had no idea that 35 years later, our first Psycom single would come out. And it is on the box. It's in the box set. It's, uh, it's either Ziola or Hokahe are the, uh, the, the, the two singles that we're putting out. We even have a video, our first video. It, uh, finally. Um, at yeah. long last. So, so okay. So, you know, Psycom, and, and that's a really cool record. And uh, uh, we should we should move on to the next things. But just maybe briefly, like, so when you hear that record, who is that guy that's singing? That like, where was he in life? And what do you hear when you listen to that music? What do you think about yourself? Well, I think to myself, I know that I'm hanging out with the right people. Um, as I say, I had a, there is a certain luxury in not having parents around. You can, you can go, go dive deeper and deeper into life, into the underground where things are, where culture is. 
And I had, I was very, very fortunate to meet up with the, the group that was putting together this group that, that we ended up to call Psycom. They were looking for a singer. They were already in the scene and they had a band called After Image. And they were intellectuals. They, they turned me on to the likes of, you know, J.G. Ballard and Philip K. Dick and, uh, you know, interesting groups. Like I say, Eisner's and Denoy Bouton and Joy Division and Susie and the Banshees. Um, and, uh, and so, and Wire. And so they, they gave me an, an education and I was the outsider. But I didn't have, like I said, I didn't have a, a house to go home to. So I just hung out with them. I would sleep over at their house and then they would give me a book to read. <laughs> and then we would rehearse later that day. And I, might, and, I might, and I started to see the world from a very intellectual, uh, yeah, it was intellectual and artistic and um, it, was, it was not the education that you will get in any high school or college. So, so it, certainly think, wasn't, yeah. it certainly was an education. So, so yeah, so you're, you're hearing yourself become you. Yeah. Uh, and then, but then, okay, so the next record in this box, we, we fast forward through, uh, you know, Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros. Like, all that happens between Psycom and Song Yet to Be Sung, your solo debut album. This comes out in the summer of 2001, a very interesting uh, moment as it turned out. Um, and it just seems like, you know, it, that's such a drastic jump cut from Psycom to this. But in that, all that time, clearly, you've absorbed a lot of different musical stuff, way beyond, you know, Joy Division and The Cure, all kinds of stuff from all over the world. Yeah. You have a, a, a clearly... There's a spiritual awakening in you here. There's a lot of Jewish imagery on this record. Yeah. Um, it's it's more sunny than anything you'd ever done. What what gave rise to all that? Well, I had a very uh, unique experience that happened to me in around 19 in 1993, 1990, beginning in 1994, where I had a vast visitation of energy and basically I was visited by spirits hmm. uh, and uh, it, one of the spirits was my mother who had died in 1962 or 63 but she visited me uh, in, in 1994 approximately and she was a, she was not alone. She was with other spirits. Hmm. At that time, I was um, in Psycom. I yeah, I had uh, started Psycom, and my life, although yes, it was it was rich in art, uh, freedom. I was you know. Uh, you know, experimentation of, of any kind, taking life, taking life as far as one could. I wanted to experience the first, you know, the, the, the heaviest experiences that I, hopefully that we, you can live through. I wanted to experience that. But when the spirits came to me, um, I couldn't ignore them. And uh, I'll tell you about something really strange. I know it sounds super bizarre, right? But uh, being that I'm in my home now, the last thing that my mother asked of me was that I call my sister up the following day and ask her for her Mahjong set. Hmm. Now, I, a lot of you don't know what a Mahjong set is, but Mahjong is a game that was played back in the 50s and 40s in, in all the five boroughs of New York. Um, it's like bridge, but for the New Yorkers, you know. Uh, they'd sit around and it, it, it's like domino, a cross between bridge and do, 
dominoes. It's got these uh, tiles, they call them, that are made out of ivory. It was a very strange request, so, but I, it, I had to do this because this is what my mother asked me, is the last thing she said to me. So it had to be important. So I did, I called my sister the next day and I asked her, I said, I spoke to mommy last night and she didn't say anything because she thought, you know, I, I hadn't seen her in a few years and she knew that I was pretty out there on drugs. But there was a silence over the line and she said, that's, she said it like this, that is so weird. She said, I just got mommy's mahjong set in the mail from auntie this morning. Now you stay right there, Mike, I'll be right back. This wow. is my mom's mahjong set. Nice. <laughs> so, every day, since that time, every day of my life, there comes a certain time of the day where I start to think about the spirit world and God and the angels and where we're going. Uh, uh, where is humanity going and how can we reach that time when there will be peace on earth this is, this is what the great uh, discussion the returning of the Shia right the returning Messiah everyone's waiting for that the Jews the Christians the Muslims you know we all have our slant on the spirit world, whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist. Uh, it is that this great question that all men have, does God even exist? All these things run through my head at a certain time of the day. I can't stop them from coming hmm. forward. I can't ignore them. So that's the change that happened to me. But of course, I didn't stop my heathenistic ways. I couldn't. It was too powerful. And, uh, you know, um, the heathenism is, my heathenism was so tied to sex, you know, sex and heathenism. The more heathenistic you are, almost the, the greater the, the, the orgasm and so I had this heathenistic life that had a visitation hmm. so what do you do it's really really hard to keep that balance of trying to enjoy your life and ha you know still have those wild times and you know that uh, that there is a heaven there's a great uh, quotation, very famous one from William Blake, and it says, he said, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. But they never put it, they never mentioned the second part of that quotation. They always leave this out. He's, but he added, for we never know what is enough until we know what is more than enough. And it sounds like that's what happened to you. I, I, you can't ignore it. I think that's why she said something as silly as, Ask about my Mahjong set, hmm. because I could have told you that story. And then, you know, of course, I know everybody thinks I'm half crazy. And <laughs> you can brush me off. Easy, right? I don't know about that. <laughs> she said, well, I know about it. Uh -huh. I know I'm half, I'm in the clouds half the time. It's true. Yeah. Oh, but I would never brush you off. I think you're really... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there are some that... Uh, some that uh, you know they, they they can't they can't handle the truth, as Jack Nicholson once said. <laughs> right. So it's, it, you know if you're going to say, well, that guy he's crazy. All right, I'll give you that, but you can't ignore something like this 
you can talk to my sister. And so I've been given this, I, I look at it as if it is a responsibility because I've been spared, I've been spared and, I, and I'm not getting goofy and, and uh, all, you know, sappy about it. You know, look, man, I still drink. I'm going to have my drink. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get wild on Friday night. I just mean though, that I, I, I know that, um, it's not the end when you die, you go someplace, but there's a, con you're still conscious. And I feel that the, uh, the universe, this is an incredible board game. We're sitting on, we're sitting on the, a, a board and it's a game and there's, there's people that, or not people, but there's spirits that they watch us. They're not allowed to interfere with us per se. It's very rare what happened to me is kind of interfering. How, how my mother did it was she spoke to me through another person's body that was asleep. So she literally used, uh, she, inhabit, she inhabited a body and used that body to talk to me. And then she left and the body was unharmed, but the body didn't know it was a, a, a girl that I was sleeping with. So, and, and, and you speak of the, the game that these spirits play. Maybe the game is Mahjong. Maybe the game is Mahjong or maybe the game is, I we can't interfere, but where can we be, a, where can we help? I think, that they can help because the one thing that they can still do is they can, they have enough force to make sound. It could show up in music. Mm. It show up in a whisper so subtle mm. that maybe you don't realize it, but when you see the one that you're one and only, the, what, the person that you want to, make your wife but you're unsure maybe they whisper go and talk to her schmuck <laughs> so you at this you this music on song yet to be sung is quite different from porno for pyros and jane's addiction uh it sounds like you were listening to chemical brothers like fat boy slim stuff like yeah. that um that that seems like prodigy. a big prodigy yeah that definitely uh, but that all sounds like that's a that's a that seems to reflect a shift in your life. Um, and like, how did you? Was it difficult to shift gears uh, musically to make that music come out the way it did? You know what, Michael? When I make music, it is a joyous occasion. Mm. I would never, I would never suffer, uh, suffer to make the music that I that I want to hear it's so it's it's a pleasure to make the music that i want to hear and so to make that music it was it was nothing short of release it's the music that was in my heart it's the music i it's the sound i really wanted to to put out to you uh, it, it was beautiful and it was, it was, it was glorious and it was, um, spiritual and, and, and um, emotional and, and joyous. That's the word. That's the word I was about to say. It, there's joy in it. And it has that technicolor thing that I was talking about that pops up in your music. Like it's just throughout. And that's a that's a wonderful album, but as I said at the outset, it comes out in summer of two thousand and one, right before nine eleven. And I, I wonder, like, what did did nine eleven? What did that do to that to the reception of that record? Where you, I, I gather, did you tour, or you know, did it get kind of? I did tour it, not very much though. Hmm. Um, I only did one one show it was the first coachella oh wow and uh, i had again i had the the most wonderful time on stage i had i must have had eight, eight dancers 
some from India. I had a pair of I had a pair of twins who were Indian belly dancers, and they had a snake, beautiful pet snake that they would dance with. And then I um, learned uh, capoeira and uh, took dance lessons from a capoeira master, uh, a woman priestess. So I, you know, some of that type of dance was in the was in the show, and some of the sound was that way. And I had this um, beautiful, uh, heavy sister playing bass. Her name was Vicky. So she had a, I always think that bass players, when, they, when they're kind of larger, they have a larger resonance. Mm -hmm. And Vicky was kind of larger, but she had a resonance, but she's a female. So it was a really unique sound. And it was the first time that I had worked with electronic music, uh, writing with uh, my co-writer, Brendan Hawkins, and Chris Sharma was also a producer. But I started at that time the system that I, that I do to this day, which is I collaborate. I come, you know, we start with a, a, a basic melody or a groove that we all agree is, is beautiful and uh, fits all the requirements. It, you know, it, it's got to have, um, Modern, modern frequencies, sub frequencies, odd sounds and shaped frequencies coming from um, uh, synthesizers, you know, the moves. Um, but also, I, I love to make music that is a complete hybrid. I love the idea of man working with machine. I will work with man only and it will be beautiful. I will work with machine only, and it will be, you know, for the right occasion, it's a perfect experience. But nothing will top a human being, the hearing a human being in there, and the human being and the machine are so intellectually connected. Uh, that, that, that experience in sound is, is where I'm at now. I'll tell you uh, quickly, uh, back to the box set, back to the Blitz, the Glamour. So the last record I did was with Tony Visconti yeah. producing, and it, it was a hybrid. So I had in part uh, an orchestra conducted by Harry Gregson Williams, um, and then I also had, um, you know, uh, people like uh, Elliot uh, e Easton, from the cars um, and Mike Garson, pianist for David Bowie, his lifetime, you know, long uh, pianist, it, you know, just wonderful, amazing uh, virtuosos, each and every one. Um, Danny Harrison, George's son, played with us as well. So I was putting together an orchestra and it all, this, this concept, started back then, song yet to be sung, where the music, you know, when I first was a little boy and I looked at the Beatles and I looked at the Stones and I saw what a group was and they get groupies and they all have a look to them and they might, you know, they might all have the same haircut uh, or just be wearing the same cool clothes. I, I wanted that. I wanted to be... Oh, I thought to be in a band would be the coolest thing in the world. And I got into the music, uh, I got into the world of music and I, and I did, I started, that first band, Psycom was cool, but it was very underground and artistic. It wasn't, it would never have been on the level of the Beatles because it, 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 it was too dark. It was so dark that, Stormy, good boy, good <laughs> quiet. Anyway, it was so dark, but I was very happy and to be that dark. I thought if I make this my life and I, this is gonna be my world for my lifetime, I may never get a chance to be this free, to get this dark because the Beatles had a pressure 
they can never get so dark. You, you know, you don't want to be so dark because you're going to cause people to, to, one of the things, one of my ambitions in life is to make people love life so much that the thought of losing their life or the thought of giving up on life is, uh, is it's, no, life is beautiful. And the experience and the gift of, of being alive is, is the greatest gift, is just simply to, to be alive is, is great and wonderful. And go out there and experience your life. You're going to die soon. We're all going to die. So don't rush it. See what you can get out of life. And that's always been my angle, my message, if you could call it anything. What I wanted to say, what I wanted to say, and what I continue to try to plead to with people is that life is beautiful. And there is, and when you experience life in love and with love, man, there's nothing better in the universe. That's, you know, and, and that, so there's another through line through, through all this music, maybe not Psycom, but all the, all your solo records is that, you know, that love of life. And that comes beaming through like all the time. There's a line on the next album that I want to get to, sat the Satellite Party record that I heard, I was listening to the music again, uh, and this line jumped out at me, good morning, Mr. Sunshine, you brightened up my day. And I thought like, wow, <laughs> like, this guy came a long way from, uh, you know, Jane's addiction, <laughs> from nothing shocking. Like, that's not a line that would have been, I think, on that album. Well, but, can, I, can I tell you an interesting thing about that? Sure. Uh, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, you know, I have a lot of fun. Uh, I don't want to call it, call it playing pranks, but now that I have this ability to put out music, um, I can place within the music all sorts of fun things uh, that I can tell you, talk about later, and, and it'll make the experience even greater. Mm -hmm. So, that particular song is off of the album, The Ultra Payloaded Satellite Party. A satellite party back then is kind of like a flash mob done by musicians and artists. What we could also call today a pop-up or a residency even, where we get together a collective, we make a scene with the best musicians and, and fine artists and writers and philosophers and poets and dancers and comedians. And we fuck with uh, fascists. We're anti-fascists. <laughs> and, and the way we, and the way we uh, express ourselves, make our point, or change the world is through art and expression. And, and that's our messaging. And we do it through social media. And that is exactly where I'm at in life right now. Now, the song, Good Morning. Um, what is the title of the song, actually? Good Morning. Uh, uh, that might have been on, was that on Awesome? I can't remember. No, it, it's Satellite Party. Oh, sorry, yeah. Satellite Party, but... The name of the song is not uh, Good Mr. Sun It's Mr. Sunshine. It's called Mr. Sunshine? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so check it out. I hid within, within a few of the songs references to classic songs. Yeah. That song is a reference to the, um, uh, the Gibb Brothers. Um, good morning, Mr. Sunshine, uh, you brighten up my day, come sit beside me, lonely days, lonely nights, <laughs> where would I be without my woman, 
the line is actually taken from another song, a classic song that I love, from the Bee Gees. And the intro comes from Hey Bulldog. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Well, let me tell That's you. What but I, do. <laughs> I sprinkle yeah. little, little classic musical references for yeah. people like you. Yeah. That are that are uh, audiophiles. Right. Isn't that, that cool? That is. Now cool. you know that. Now check that song out. Right. I put that all together. But I did. I I called up uh, Barry Gibb and asked him if I could use the line. Oh, wow. I was doing it in a couple of other places that I'm not going to tell you. So now when you listen to the album, you'll just have to go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I, I, I caught the Doors reference in Ultra. You did? I got that. Okay, now I'm going to keep listening. You know, the thing about this record, um, uh, there's a whole backstory to this, you know, and I don't know if you could tell it in a brief way, but there's the musician and the, the night nurse, and they may or may not be dreaming. Uh, well, you, uh, maybe you should, is, can you tell it in a nutshell, what the whole story behind this, that record well, is? the story is that these gr this group of, this collective of, of culturalists, we'll call them, hmm. they're out there right now, too. And we can get together through the use of, you know, telecommunication. Or we can say, let's have a party over there. And let's fight fascism over there. And let's bring clean water over there. And then let's get the hell out of here before they arrest us. Because, <laughs> you know, those fascists, they have no <laughs> sense of humor. Right. And so ba that's the basic premise of the, uh, of the story. Now... While I was writing the record, I got a phone call from Israel, from uh, th this man and this woman that told me that they had me, uh, Jim Morrison. They had tapes of Jim Morrison um, doing poetry and singing songs, and no one has this, and that Jim Morrison wants me to have these tapes. <laughs> this is a true story. Again, it sounds like, yeah, well, that Perry's a little crazy. <laughs> so whatever. Who the heck, you know, it sounds like it's it's too it's couldn't be true. Well, I said to the people, I said, well, give me the brick, you know, send the send the tapes and do Dropbox, send me the material. They sent me, I think, eight to ten songs and poems of Jim Mo Morrison a cappella that I have. But of course, I couldn't put these songs out. They don't belong to me. This is intellectual property that belongs to the Morrison estate. So I had to go to the Morrison estate and tell them, you know, you're going to find this bizarre, but and I played them the tapes. I played them um, first to Danny Sugarman, who was Jim Morrison, uh, the Doors manager. And uh, he was two weeks from death. Mm. But I sat with him. He, he you know, um, he let me come in and he was in his bed. Um, Fawn Hall, I believe, became his wife. Wow. Um, isn't that crazy? So I was greeted by the door. I opened the door and there's Fawn Hall. She's still beautiful. Um, all, she was Oliver North's secretary. Yeah. And uh, she had to go testify during the Reagan era. It's a long story. But anyway, there she is. I, 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 um, go, she leads me back to Danny's bedroom, which is basically his death room. He was in his bed, and we were rocking out and listening to Jim, and listening to him say things and poetry. It was it was the most beautiful thing because I also loved Jim Morrison, and to be able to hear him, you you know, um, you you never think you would ever get to hear someone that you loved speaking again. But anyway, that 
that uh, I wrote a song called, uh, he wrote a song, it's his song. I took the song that um, the people from Israel sent me that I was given permission by the estate and I made this song called Woman in the Window. And it's a very important song. Number one, because it's a song that Jim Morrison is singing that no one had ever heard before. But at the end of the song, I called it, I had to title it because he didn't title these things. He just, it was him with a microphone in the recording studio. He might have been reading from a book. These might have been melodies he had been saving up. But anyway, there was a basic melody that he had in his voice that I had to put to music and create the verse chorus and, and everything else, dropouts. I used it as, um, I looked at it like I'd be making music that would be, let's say, beat poetry with music behind it. And I love that idea. I, today I still, I'm working on concepts like that musically where you know music can do its thing the voice doesn't always have to sing but it could and it should if it's good at it and in this case Jim sang a little and he spoke a little but is is the the main the most important part of the song comes when he slows down the music and he says Open your window, woman of Palestine. Throw down your raiment and cover us over. So, I um, <clears throat> that line really got to me. Mm. Uh, being a Jewish man and um, the love I have for the Jewish people and the Palestinian people. So, yeah. I, I wanted to take that song and do something very special with it. Something, I don't call it non, non-profit, but earth, earth changing. I felt it deserved it. So I sent it off to a young woman who is a producer in Palestine. And she's doing the remix right now, as well as a young man in Israel. Hmm. So, I have Israel and Palestine working together musically. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> and uh, and that will come out at some point. This is in the box set. Oh, it's in the box. Oh, cool. Oh, I it's didn't in hear the that. Box set. Uh huh. Yes, and the remixes. Yeah. So, and I also have yet another Jim Morrison track right. called "Vast Visitation." Yeah. And. Um, of course, I never met Jim Morrison. I met all the other doors, hmm. but Jim had died by the time I had met them. Anyway, he wrote that song, Vast Visitation. And it was about a vast visitation of energy coming to visit. And so I put that song together with the memory of my mother and the, the, the angelic camp that she, she was with was the vast visitation of energy mm. so on the box in the box set in the glitz the glamour you'll have uh, um, the song that um, woman in the window uh, you know woman um, open your window Woman of Palestine. That song is called Woman in the Window. And I'm hoping that that starts the peace process through music and love. Because that's where it's got to, that's where it's got to originate. With, of, with people that are, people that are uh, selling weapons and killing and spilling blood will never be able to affect peace. It's people that believe in love and brotherhood. Yeah, well, that's that takes you. That's that's the, those are the solutionists, right? The the, that's right. Collab, the the brain trust of musicians and artists and environmentalists and things like that yes. who can find who can actually find the solutions. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
and, and that's a that's a key part of this record. Now, it, on the nuts and bolts of this record, there's I, I looked at like you have Jack Irons and Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Fergie from Black Eyed Peas, your and John Frusciante, yeah, John Frusciante, um, Peter Hook, Tony Canal, and Nuno Betancourt. Like you have this incredible like a team of musicians. Um, well, I guess a few of them, I mean, that was just like a logistical thing, just wrangling all these people to, for recording sessions. But it's so interesting that punk rock started of with people who quote unquote couldn't play, but now like some of the most punk rock people can totally play. And those are the people that you play with. You always have the most incredible musicians on your records. Thank you. And, uh, I don't know why is that. <laughs> why, why not have more primitivist people? You always have totally amazing players. I guess it's, the answer is in itself, but I'm curious about that. Uh, well, like I say, if I were to think to put together a song, I wouldn't want to do it all by myself. Hmm. Oh, that might be. I'm sorry. The doctor is here for COVID test, so Ian is asking. Well, we're asking you to wrap it up. Okay. Because you need a COVID test for the bony scenario. Oh. Okay. And the doctor's pulling out. So, all right, darling. Yeah. All right. Like two minutes. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I I feel that I love to work off of of other. Uh, you know, off of genius. I love to work off of people that are genius. It's, it's the most fun. And I also believe that really the best music is, is egoless. In other words, I think, you know, in the world, if you can say one thing that is wrong with the world that we can fix is that I think that, uh, We've gone too far. We were doing pretty well in the uh, 40s be before there was GMOs and pesticides, you know, uh, or, or transportation that destroyed the environment. Before we had global warming, it was just about right, right? I mean, you could tell our biosphere, it was nice. And that, uh, you know, that's an accomplishment. But we went too far. And I think um, if, you, if you look at, at music and trying to make music the best it can be, I think we went too far when the, when the <clears throat> music industry started signing up people and making a lot of money off of records. It always is that greed when greed gets into something, it, it, it will destroy it. It's like a cancer. Greed is just like a cancer. Once it gets into things, they start to die. And it, it and, should, yeah. And it affects something as sacred as music, which is really sad. But right. Really, so but, we have, but, I, but I'm not finished. I'm almost there. Okay. But why I make music the way I do is because, look, I can't, there are people that can write beats better than me. But if I were to just be an ego-filled guy, you want me, you know, I'm going to make all the money, I'm going to fuck, I can fuck you and keep all the money, and people are here to see me, and I'm going to write another song. I, I'm going to tell you, I won't say who their names are, but it's probably every, every musician that I even love. When they don't share and they don't they don't um have other people to bounce off of it becomes this ego thing where what happens is you're a certain vibration every person is i'm the vibration that i am if you love my vibration i can bring it to you but that's all i can really do and so but i like to i like music that is dense and deep and rich in dimension and so to get a deeper heavier uh, uh, vibration you can't, don't look to me for it look to me for the area where i sin that's the best that i can do other than that use a bass player that can play bass great 
a guitar player that's great, a programmer that can make us all excited, then you're going to have, it's like, it's like, um, I feel that the, the golden era of Hollywood, 1945, if you look at those movies, each and every one of those movies are just so wonderful because of the craftsmanship and the time that they took, whether it be the costume, the set design, whoever sang, whoever danced, they were lovely. They were, they were dressed beautifully. They sounded wonderful. And it was timeless. But I want to be a part of an art project that is that. I'm not, I, I, I can slow my mind down and it, it, it comes from don't be so full of ego. Allow a great guitar player to, you want to work with the best because then collectively you will be champions. Uh, um, that, great, thank you for that answer. Um, just to wrap up, so this, what, what's this Bowie thing and what's coming up for you in 2021? <laughs> Well, in 2021, I'm going to be doing a little bit of uh, satellite party pop-ups uh, with the Kind Heaven Orchestra. Cool. I'm going to be recording with them, hopefully with Jane's Addiction, hopefully with Porn of Papyrus. I want to try to get off at least a dozen songs and then remix those songs. And this, um, and back to uh, what I'm doing currently with uh, the Bowie Project, um, Tony Visconti, Mike Garson are putting this together, and it's kind of like what we did with Lala Live. It's performances, and it's all performances of David Bowie's music. Uh, sometimes with the people that wrote the songs with David, certainly performed them with David. And uh, I'm going to be one of them. Very proud to be a part of that. What song are you going to sing? The Man Who Sold the World. Wow. That's a heavy jam. It's coming out great. You should hear it. Uh, you I will. Can. Yeah, I will. Yeah, that's great. Um, all right. Well, I don't want to keep you from something that sounds very important. <laughs> but it's really nice Thank chatting you. with you, Perry. Thank you. Nice to chat with you, too. Yeah. And, um, yeah, stay safe and be well. Yes. Oh, Here's by the way, up. here's a picture of you and me. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. Wow. You can't see. But uh, that was in Washington, D.C. in 1999. Were we talking about dioxin on, on the White House lawn? And <laughs> I think we were talking about Tibet. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So, yeah, good times. Yeah, that was a really, uh, that was an amazing outfit you had. <laughs> Thank you. So, so uh, yeah, anyway, really great chatting with you. And uh, the, the box set, Glitz and the Glamour, really is such a, a technicolor, uplifting journey. It's really cool. Congratulations. Thank you, Michael. And the memoir is fantastic. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you in yeah, person. You yeah, you too.